the river and the sun, the twin gifts of the gods that supported the civilization of ancient Egypt. From the distant age of the pyramid builders until the present time, the great river has served as the nation's highway. In ancient times, it was also the main artery of the state, carrying both Pharaoh's gilded bark and the state barges that took the royal grain to our village. The village of the craftsmen who made the tombs of the kings. Just imagine that you're in this same place, the ancient town of Esna, just south of Thebes in Upper Egypt, 3,000 years ago. Or to be more exact, imagine you're here on the 8th of September, 1085 BC, 2,000 years before the Battle of Hastings. You're in a similar boat, made of wood perhaps, not the iron, with a different rigging, with a similar sized crew, and down in the hold, scribbling away at his notes, an ancient scribe, scribe Jutmos, <laughs> the chief man of our village, the village of the people that made the royal tombs. He's come to Esna to gather wheat. He's a lucky man in a way, and head of the village now, because a few years earlier the village had been close to starvation. Now the scribes were themselves going out into the countryside to get their own food, to gather their own wheat. He'd come to Esna to the temple granary to exact the royal taxes. And he'd come at a wonderful time of year, on the high Nile flood, when the river runs straight out to the desert, the whole thing glistened like silver, a wonderful trip. And when he went back with enough wheat to keep him for two months, going high on the wind, happy to feed his village again. Especially happy indeed. For a few years earlier, this green land, the breadbasket of Thebes, and some of the world's most fertile fields had withered and died. For a while, the farmers had managed to feed the city from stocks they had gathered in during more plentiful harvests. But slowly, inexorably, famine came to the valley. It was as if the desert had come down to the river's edge, and they called it the Year of the Hyena. The man in charge of this terrible time was him, the high priest. He ruled Thebes. He ruled all the thousands of temple bureaucrats and everybody. In fact, he was a very important man. On this relief, for example, he appears exactly the same height as the king. It's quite subtle, because the king has been put on a little plinth, but if you actually measure the figures up, they're the same height. So the high priest has become a really big deal. But still, being a priest, he didn't have an army. And so when the starvation hit the area in the year of the hyenas, when there was really terrifying times at Thebes. He had no way of controlling the riots that took place. And so somebody was brought in from Nubia. The Viceroy of Nubia came with his black troops up the Nile and took control of Thebes. And liked it so much, he stayed. Now, how do you think we know all this? Well, right through the Theban temples runs a fragile thread of history. a busted hieroglyphic text on a temple wall. Of course, the temples are covered in these, and it really tells you how careful you have to be when you come to places like this. You don't run into them or kick them or stand on them or something. Because these have got hundreds of years of history in them, these things. This one, for example, only exists in half. See, these are the lines of the hieroglyphs here. And originally, there was a block on top above. We can get more than you might think out of this. These tiny little marks and things, and some of them are made by tourist boots, 
But just look at this. If I put this mirror here, see those signs jumping? Now, perhaps that's where a tourist has gone and kicked the wall or something like that. But if you really look closely, sometimes you can see the ancient chisel marks. And we know what sort of chisel marks we're talking about. So when you get to a sign right up here on the edge, look at that line jump, jump up into shape there. And that can tell you the difference between the guy coming up from Newbury or not coming up from Newbury can be that important. That's why this sort of work is so interesting. Might not look much, but it's really fascinating. It's better than digging holes in the ground. Anyway, these columns, they ran up here, of course, onto another block. We don't have the other block now. But very fortunately, the guy who worked on this particular wall, the man who first translated it, realised that all this was a copy of an inscription on the base of a statue. And so he was able to restore these bits we didn't have. But of course, there are four unique lines in this text, and they're the ones we're interested in. And they're over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight months from the year of the hyena. You know, it's the only mention of this in any temple in Egypt. See, in this inscription, this way, that's just prayers to Ammon. But in that direction, it's actually the speech of a man from 3,000 years ago. It's his voice speaking to us on a lump of history. And it tells us of the state's collapse, of a time of terrible anarchy. Poor old Egyptians. First of all, their high priest is suppressed. Then the Nubian viceroy, who turned up with his troops to put things right, started to settle here. It was 10 years of chaos. It must have been very hard life. But the king settled it. He sent his general here to take control. And this is his name. Written here. Harry Hall. Don't forget it. They're coming back to him. Because he's a man, really, who left the biggest mystery of the village, I think you might say. He was also powerful enough to get his name in a royal cartouche. Powerful enough, too, to instigate a series of royal commissions to look at all the terrifying things that happened in the year of the hyena. Scribe Jutmose was appointed on the commission that was to investigate the looting of the temples in the year of the hyenas. It was a terrible time. It was a time when a woman with a small garden of date palms could sell little pressed blocks of dates for silver was a time when thieves called their loot bread. That's not in the modern hip sense of the word, but in a very real sense, because they were stealing for bread. And in the temple itself, Jutmos found even more terrible things had happened. When Jup Mose and the commissioners investigated what had happened in the temple, the situation looked even worse. See, these doorways were once partly plated in gold. See, these holes along the bottom here probably held the wedges that held the gold lay flat on the walls all around here. In the centre, of course, would have been two vast cedar doors. The wood alone was worth a fortune. It had come all the way from the Lebanon, after all. And the cedar was covered, in this case, with copper and bronze in great quantity. We know that because Jut Moses' commission had a very, made a very accurate record of exactly what happened here. And what happened was this. The junior employees in the temple started slowly, presumably as they started to starve, slowly to nibble away at the copper, and nobody noticed, so they took some more. And nobody noticed, and they took some more. Then one day, their boss came in and noticed that all the copper was being stripped off the doors. And whilst they waited in trepidation, he asked for his cut of the loot, which they gave him, and that, of course, was the end. Because behind these doors that the priest had stripped and sawn into blanks lay the shrines of the gods, and so the priests move in on them. These shrines, you see, were cedar boxes covered with a very heavy gold, sort of much heavier than a gold leaf, really, quite heavy stuff. And this was what they pulled off, stripped away, and then the carpenters came in and sawed the planks up. It's the end of Egypt. Although 
They carried on in this church for a thousand years. It was really a, a recreation of the original. The original flower was lost in the year of the hyena. Poor scribe Jutmose. Instead of making new monuments, he now spent his time investigating the plundering of the works of his forefathers. It was a time of disillusion and insecurity, and a hard age for his villagers. Scribe Jutmos left us no great monuments of his own, but he scribbled all over the cliffs here at Thebes. This is one of the more extraordinary, as he's put the actual date he came here and scratched into the rock. October the 5th, 1079 BC. That's a date he works out now, of course. In those days, he pre-expressed it year 18, such and such a time. And there's his name, Scribe Jutmos. And with it, he's written four generations of his family, right back to great-grandfather Ammonacht. Of course, things were very different in Ammonacht's day. He was a big man who made big tombs in a rich state. Scribe Jutmose was overseeing the dissolution of all that. He was more interested in his family, little things, memorialising the great relatives that had had in the past. Our scribe had come to this lonely valley to check on that ancient royal tomb behind me. And he was particularly interested in it, because the generals of his own time didn't want to be buried in the public tombs in the Valley of the Kings, but were looking once again at these little remote valleys to put their own secret tombs inside. With these new rulers and their new style of tomb would come a different life for the old village. And perhaps this was none too soon. By this time, Jut Moses' ancestors had been burying the village dead for 500 years in this crumbling hillside. Scribe Jut Mose couldn't build himself a tomb like this. There was simply no room left above ground. And underneath, the hillside was like a Swiss cheese, riddled with holes. The cemetery was simply full up. Things were just as bad in the village. The old houses were getting really decrepit. In this one, for example, the roof collapsed during a brief rainstorm, and all the papyrus rolls that were stored in here, it was the village library, were soaked. And if you go to the BM, the British Museum, or the Louvre, and you see the rolls of papyrus today, you can see on their backs the sand where the scribes had laid them out here on the ground to dry. The walls, as you can see, are all buckling. 25 coats of paint now covered them. So it was really time to move. There are other reasons too. General Harryhor, who ruled Thebes, really needed an independent body of intelligent, literate Thebans to help him run the place, because he didn't really want to get involved with the old power blocks, the priests and the army. They were really rather discredited in the year of the hyenas. The villagers, were therefore, were his perfect choice. Family by family, they moved down to the enclosure of the fortress temple that held the offices of the administration. So the village moved to this part of the temple enclosure at Medinit Harbu. The scribe Jutmo has built himself a magnificent house here. These are the ruins of it I'm walking through at the moment. Much, much bigger than anything he'd ever had at the village, and quite in keeping with his status as one of the most important men in Upper Egypt. Actually, he was away most of the time, and it was his son, Buta Amun, who actually put out these columns. So it was Buta Amun who had himself carved on the columns of his house at Medina Tabu. And he really is our last character in all of village history. He was a kind man, had a big family. He loved his mother and father, and he had great reverence for the traditions of Thebes, for the old kings and temples. He lived in a difficult time. It was a time when, as the generals had given the villagers land so they would be self-sufficient, they were all learning to be farmers. In a sense, it was squire Butam and now. And you have this unlikely picture of these tomb makers who haven't touched a, a farm implement for 500 years, rushing around asking farmers how to plant trees and things. But it was quite a hard life. And poor Butam's wife died in the process. 
and, and he was very fond of her. He wrote her this really very touching letter. Good to me are my mother and father. They have come, but you, my wife, have been taken away from me. You who brought the cattle home. You who attended to our fields. You who were loaded with all kinds of heavy loads when there was no resting place to put them down. O Achtoi, my wife, you gracious one as woman. The death of his wife seems to have made the young Buta Ammon wise beyond his years. And that perhaps was just as well, for the task that now confronted him was grim. With scribe Jutmos away from Thebes, the generals asked his son, Buta Ammon, to open the tombs in the Valley of the Kings again. Buteramon would have slithered down this same corridor on the way to inspect the tomb, then come to a sudden halt here, right on the edge of a 40-foot pit, designed, amongst other things, to stop thieves. Then he could have looked over at the doorway on the other side, and there he would have seen the robber's hole, the great rope hanging down from it like a tail. Depressed, I expect, he threw his own rope down here and crossed, crossed to the other side, but well, he probably used the robber's rope to climb up. And look, still, down there, the same rope that they all used. By the time that Buteramon had got this far into the royal tomb, he must have realised that another king's burial had been robbed. And once again, as he entered the royal burial chamber, he found the lid of the sarcophagus pushed to one side and then realised with that awful sinking feeling, I expect, that another king had been robbed and the jewellery torn off his body. Well, what would you have done? You see, Buta Ammon hadn't just found a king that had all his jewellery taken off him. The corpse had been hacked about, all the bandages had been split open. And the tomb, well, that had been rendered into fragments. It was as if somebody like Cromwell, perhaps, had gone into the abbey and torn everything to pieces, with every little item of any value smashed to fragments. That was a depressing scene that Bhutan had to deal with. The statues of the gods that stood round the king in their shrines. These had been taken out, the arms and legs had been ripped off, thrown against the wall. Everything was stripped, everything was bare, everything rendered into useless fragments. These, for example, were simple jars that held grain. And even these, the thieves went round and smashed them to see if there was anything hidden amongst the grain. Well, what would you have done to save the ancient kings? For 3,000 years after Buta Ammon's death, no one knew the answer. Then, just over 100 years ago, the truth came to light as a modern villager, Ahmed Abdur Rasul, walked down this mountain track. Today, the frightening path is called Agatha Christie's path, after an episode in one of her stories when a criminal uses it as a shortcut to build up a false alibi. But as young Ahmed climbed that day, he had solved another mystery. For across the valley, he'd spotted a small hole, just there in the cleft of sunlight was a recent cave-in, and, the shrewd Ahmed realised, the entrance to an ancient tomb. Ahmed and his brothers had opened one of the most remarkable archaeological discoveries of all time. 
one of the secret vaults where Buta Ammon's kings had finally been laid to rest. A dozen pharaohs in a borrowed tomb. The brothers treated their treasure trove with great care, visiting it but three times in ten years and then taking only the richest and most precious of its treasures to sell to private collectors. But with all their care, their secret was out and a cat and mouse game developed. The whole problem of which museum should house these royal mummies became a contest between the Abrasor brothers and the professional Egyptologists. The Egyptologists, of course, were in it for a number of reasons. There were certain political advantages from such a great discovery, and there was also professional advantages in their career. But perhaps most important was the simple fact that pure science demanded they should find the tomb intact and not as handed out bit by bit by the Abrasul brothers. The Abrasul brothers, on the other hand, well, their demands were a little less esoteric. After all, the Turks had been occupying Egypt for a long time and had reduced this part of the country to extreme starvation. Finding a tomb like this was really finding the crock of gold, and the family held on to their discovery with a tremendous tenacity. The authorities came into this house here and dug up the floor, found nothing. They threw one of the brothers in prison. Another they taught to such an extent he could never walk properly again. But in the end, the Abrasals managed to bargain with the authorities, by which they did quite well. And after about a year of this dickering and havering backwards and forwards, a terrible war of nerves, one of the three brothers led the Europeans to the ancient kings. From Times were very hard and even with their soldiers to guard them, the Egyptologists were frightened when they came to take the ancient kings. In a great procession, like that Thebes had seen many times over the millennia, the ancient kings, all wrapped in ship sails for their journey to Cairo, were carried back down from the desert and into Thebes again, past the fortress temple where Buta Ammon had lived, through the ruined monuments of the ancient kings. And there, it is said, a strange thing happened. For as the soldiers and the Egyptologists carried off their trophies, all the villagers came to watch this strange progress, and a great wail, like that heard at the ancient funerals, echoed again through the Theban fields through the empty temples and into the desert cemeteries beyond. Their kings were leaving them forever. Whilst Buta Ammon collected ancient kings, his father, scribe Jutmo, sailed south on a mission for the generals that ruled Thebes. His boat landed at Elephantini, the town on the southern border of Egypt, its name taken from the strange-shaped granite rocks that seemed, to the ancients, to be carved into stony elephants. And there he wrote home to his village, the start of a remarkable correspondence between father and son 
that is one of our most vivid slices of ancient life. Chutmo started by describing his journey south. I've reached the general, he said. Indeed, I found that he sent a boat to meet me. I met him at the town of Elephantini, and there he gave me bread and beer. And he said to me, may the war god favor you. We are going up to Nubia to meet the rebels, the place where they are. His letter arrived safely in Buta Ammon's house. But can you imagine here in the family home at Thebes, the scribe sitting on his chair here, all the family all around him as they sat and tried to write a letter to bolster up the old man's spirits. Do not go forth to see the fighting, they said. You have not been taken there as a prisoner or press ganged. You have been taken south in order that advice may be sought of you. Stay in the bottom of the boat. Protect yourself against the arrows and spears. You are not to abandon us all, for you know that you are the father of us all. And as soon as my letter reaches you, please write me a letter in your handwriting that I may know you are still alive. The son must have been greatly reassured by his father's next letter, because it contained all that marvellous individual mix of compassion and irritableness that he must have known so well by this time. Now, by the way, that old man was deep in Nubia. He was praying to strange gods. He says at the top of his letter, I tell every day Satis and Anukis to cause you to live and to be in health, not the old gods of Thebes. Then goes on to give his son an order, rather a sad order. The general has said to me, cause the men to work on the spears. You're to give the coppersmiths the village chisels and have them made into spears. In other words, the tools which the villagers traditionally used in the royal tombs were now to be used for armaments. And in many ways, that's the end of the village life. And then, a pure blast of his old dad. Why do you not write to me and tell me what is in your heart, he says. Do not cease writing to me. Boot Ammon must have smiled a bit when he got his father's impatient letter. But he replied in good enough heart. Now the children are all right. Your wife and daughter are all right. No harm has come to them. All your people are alive, prospering and healthy. Then he went on to discuss some business. Some spears had got lost that he'd sent to his father with the troops and some bandages too. Indeed, the, the campaign had started so quickly that even the general had left his clothes behind on, when he got on the boat. And at the end of the letter, he made a usual prayer. Now, he said, I am praying to the Ammon of our old village. I'm standing in his open court, daily, unweakening, praying that soon we may fill our embrace with you again. The scribe's last letters from Nubia were written in a deserted fort next to a closed gold mine a long way from anywhere. I tell the Horus of Kuban, he said, this strange, neglected place, to bring me back alive from Yar. Now, Yar's a strange name. If you look at Egyptian letters, you'll find it can be anywhere. It can be in Egypt, Syria, Nubia, just about anywhere. One Egyptologist has suggested the true meaning, I think, and that is hellhole, a really awful place. He goes on, the scribe goes on, I am abandoned in this far off land and cannot fill my embrace with you. When your letter reached me, my heart became alive, my eyes opened and I raised my head, whereas I had been ill. But now I am all right again. And then he goes on with the normal thoughts of village business. Give your attention to the donkeys and the men who are in the fields and pray to Ammon to bring me back alive. Sadly, the old scribe didn't live long after he wrote that letter. We don't know whether he returned to Thebes or not. Certainly he died about that time and was buried in the family vault. At the desert village, the sand was now slowly covering the houses. And the rooms where the tomb makers and their families had sat and laughed together in the evening light were being sealed in to be carefully excavated 3,000 years later. No longer would the villagers climb up from their houses to the cemetery and leave offerings for their ancestors. No more would the villagers light the little candles in a ghostly Halloween to guide the souls of their ancient dead back from their pilgrimage to the city of Osiris.
even the records of Buta Amman and his family suddenly stop. And then, as the villagers completely disappear, we suddenly realize how fragile has been this link with these ancient lives. By happy chance, however, Buta Amman's own coffin has been preserved, the final product of this village of master painters who made some of Egypt's finest monuments and can proudly stand beside the best draftsmen of any age. Scribe himself painted some of this. Images of the royal tombs now decorating the coffins of a humble scribe. And here, Buta Amman's smile holds in it, perhaps, a hint of a final extraordinary mystery. Remember Harry Hoare and his cartouche? The man who left us with a mystery? Because the villagers buried him, but we've never found his tomb. Come to that, the village buried two of his successors and we haven't found their tombs either. And we know that they are still in their tombs and still probably unplundered, surrounded by all the treasures of their burial. For not one piece of Harry Hoare's tomb has ever been found unlike other monarchs who are now in museums, though their tombs are still unknown. Now in Herihor's day, the Valley of the Kings lay robbed and opened. No king would have ever been buried there. We may assume then that the general rests in other cliffs, buried far away from the old cemeteries by Buta Ammon and his villagers. A congregation of clues has led me into these distant valleys. These ancient paths, for one, beautifully made and well designed, range mile after mile into the desert hills often rising up through sheer cliffs by means of hidden staircases that are cut into the clefts in the rock face. Five and even 10 miles from food and water paths run on and on, leading sometimes to ancient settlements, shelters for people in a hard environment usually inhabited only by scorpions, snakes and crows. Judging by the pottery that still lies all around them, the settlement dates to the age of our villages. What then was happening here? Well, Another man was also puzzled by these strange signs of ancient life, and he spent month after month walking through these hills. <laughs> there he is, Howard Carter, 1916, six years before he discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. If you want to ever see anything interesting in these wadis, Look for that name, because the chances are Howard Carter got there before you. He's the first man ever to look in these desolate, distant places when all the other archaeologists were working down in the big temples. He was in these lonely desert valleys looking for royal tombs. And he really hit a jackpot, because on this wall is a really massive inscription. You can't see it, it's rather difficult to see, but because it's scratched very faintly, but it's here in great long lines of text. And what it tells us is, that in a certain day, in January 1057 BC, the scribe, Buta Ammon, our old friend, came out here to look in the mountains, the next sign, 
where there were coffins left. Somebody reported that there were coffins laying around out here in the mountains. Buta Ammon came up here with a group of men for five or six days. Now what on earth was a royal scribe, such a senior man, doing in such a desolate place? Well, the answer, as Howard Carter discovered, lies just over this ridge. That tomb is the reason why Carter was scouring these wadis. It's the tomb of Queen Hatshepsut, and he's credited as being the discoverer of it, or Lord Carnarvon is, who wasn't even in Egypt at the time. But let me tell you the whole story, because it's one, really, on which the sun will never set, a perfect empire yarn. Carter was sitting in his house one night, and his servant came and told him that eight men were robbing a tomb high in the mountains. So Carter set out with his own rope, and by midnight, he was on the top of that cliff over there, looking down the side. He couldn't see anything, it was pitch black, but he could hear voices murmuring way down, and he saw a rope hanging down by the side of the tomb. So he cut the rope, put up his own, and then climbed down it into the darkness, into the night. What an extraordinary thing to do, what extraordinary confidence those people had. So, climbed down into the tomb, and then, as he puts it, there was an awkward moment. You can imagine it, can't you? The Englishman standing there in his, in his jodhpurs and eight amazed local people, wondering what the hell was going to happen next. So, a few sentences passed between them, and as Carter said, they saw reason and scrambled up his rope and ran off into the dark. And Carter it was, then, who was left as king of the tomb. So, let's recap. What led us into this distant valley was these old paths. The strange settlement, the rock inscription of scribe Buta Ammon himself, and then at the valley's ending, a royal tomb. In the next valley, the same pattern repeats itself. Buta Ammon was there, Howard Carter excavated these deep pits, and he also found this tomb where a princess had been buried, but sadly it had been ruined long before Carter's day. And in the next valley too, the pattern is again to be found. Here, hidden deep in this cleft, was a tomb cut for three princesses, and this has provided much of the splendid ancient gold in New York's Metropolitan Museum. This entire network of valleys is filled with the same clues, and these repeat themselves in the same pattern, one after another. Clearly, the tomb makers labored long and hard in this distant place, for hundreds of years, right up to the time of King Harry Hall. And that's why I believe that the search for the lost tombs should be continued in these valleys. Let me show you what I look for. Well, I'm especially interested in these deep cracks, for example, that run right down into the valley floor. One of the real giveaways for finding one of these tombs is this great crack, because a lot of the ancient tomb makers used these cracks as one wall of the shaft which they would dig down into the ground. Then, of course, when they dug the tomb, they would put some plaster over the top of it, and these cracks, which were made by being waterfalls, would fill up again with that sort of debris there and cover the tomb completely, so it would absolutely vanish. But the most important clue, the one that really tells you this is a tomb, is on this wall over here. Because this piece of wall here has been chiselled away by a man using a flint axe. Look, it's, it's quite obvious when you come to see it. First of all, along the edge here, you can see the bashes that the flint's made. See? One, two, three, four, five, boom, boom, boom. And you know that's not natural, because you can see the grain in this rock. Look, here on this edge, where he's really bashed it away, he's chipped off lumps going that way. So this rock is actually, the grain in this rock is like a sandwich, and this guy's been cutting the end off. It could never 
naturally go like that sort of surface. In a hundred thousand years it couldn't go like that. So all this here has been smoothed off naturally by man. And then here, of course, well that little thing's a footmark, a foothold for the man to go down into the tomb. So, having proved that this is man-made, we've got a nice big hole beneath us, this is the tomb for going into. And I must say, whenever I do go into these tombs, I always leave my hat at the top so people know where I am. Oh, blimey, I once got stuck in a tomb like this. Blooming hours I'll ask it now. Somebody had to come and lift me off in the end. It was terrible. Oh dear. Full up. Oh my god. Well, still full up. Nobody's been down there in a long time. And that, I think, is the bottom of a large water jar. Perhaps from the burial, perhaps from the people who made the tomb. Certainly it's from the same time as the tomb, about 1500 BC. But that's some 500 years too early for Harry Hall, so I have concentrated my search in an even more remote valley. Let me show you why. Here's our man again, Howard Carter, 1916. It's a very busy year, he must have been rushing about all over the place. Why was he excited enough to write his name here? Well, to start with, somebody else has written their name here, a few years before him. Buta Ammon, our royal scribe, was here a thousand years BC. He buried kings. But the most important clue on this rock and even nearer to Howard Carter's own name, is the name of the priest king, Harry Hall. Remember him, the man who built the temple in Karnak? Well, his tomb's never been found. But there is a papyrus in Vienna which actually talks about building it. Archaeologists assume it's somewhere around here. I think Carter had a pretty good idea where it was. Which is why, of course, he dug so many holes here, looking for a buried tomb. Spurred on, no doubt, by these rationalists of ancient workmen. And inscriptions that tell us of royal tombs. But the biggest clue of all in this desolate place is this nondescript heap of rubble. This hillside might just look like a crummy heap of rock, but it's actually far more than that. You see, these sort of stones, these type of chippings, really don't occur naturally. They're made by man banging at a rock. Hopefully, of course, making a tomb in this case. The extraordinary thing about this hillside, too, is that we can tell almost how old it is. And that's because of its colour. You see, these beautiful amber rocks around us get this way because of particles of clay that are brought here in the wind. It's ordinary white limestone, just like you get on the South Downs, but it's stained, it's almost like a suntan, this beautiful brown colour. And that's, of course, is what you can see here. Now, that takes two or three thousand years to build up. But if we yank out one of these rocks, you can see there, it's pure white underneath. That rock's been there a long time, and it's been cut by man. So, Carter comes to this empty valley full of its inscriptions, and there in the middle is a huge pile of rocks, which from his experience in the Valley of the Kings looked just like tomb chippings. What, what was he to think? Well, for the answer to that, you have to turn to his laundry list. He was a busy man and scribbled away on anything you could find. And on this list, under items that say he's got to pay his houseboy, and buy some raspberry jam, we find a list of the things he found in this valley. Now, we found fragments of wood, that is, bits of scaffolding and things like this. He found bits of rope, very handy for moving things. He found charcoal from the men's cooking. The most important thing of all 
was he found something which he called a boss from a sarcophagus. In fact, he found four of them. Now, these sarcophagi bosses, these are rather interesting things. These are left by the people who cut the sarcophagi from the rock, standing out from the main shape of the sarcophagus. They're very useful when you're moving these big, heavy things through the landscape, to have something to tie the rope onto, like big knobs. Of course, when you put them in the tomb, you then cut them off so the sides are left nice and smooth. Of course, we never found the sarcophagus, but Carter found four bosses in this very valley. So, what an immense amount of evidence is here. The pathways leading to the site, the men's houses, the inscriptions that mention a tomb, chippings that come from a tomb. It's fairly obvious, isn't it? Somewhere in this great circle of cliffs lies at least one king, silent in an unplundered tomb. And that is why I come here whenever I can, searching out ancient clues, and perhaps even the tomb itself. Perhaps isolated here on a sheer cliff. Perhaps like Carter's, hidden deep in a rocky cliff. It's a long and arduous business, Eventually, the entire valley must be mapped, and every little text, every small piece of evidence, hunted down and carefully evaluated. Evidence like this faint ancient path running diagonally across your screen. A path, incidentally, that leads straight to the bottom of this rocky cleft. It's a good one. Nobody's been around here for a long time. Nobody's dug it. No later things, no pots. This could be quite a good one. Goodness me. Well, this is it. The end of the line. The end of the ancient road, too. I didn't expect to see great gold pots sticking out the ground or a huge shining white door with a royal necropolis seal stamped in the middle of it. I tell you why. Because I came up that great scree of rock and that's come down from the chimney quite recently in the last few centuries, brought down by the bats that live up there and the water that's washed down through here. So we're actually, about 10 feet above any ancient level that's in here. But still, you can sometimes find something to look at around here. Some little mark, some ancient chisel mark, perhaps, because, you see, the ancient masons often smoothed the rock up for several metres above tomb doors. Sometimes they left little dots of red ochre about the place. Well, there's nothing here, though. Not a mark. But nonetheless, this is a very good place. This is absolutely virgin site. I mean, there's been no Christian hermit has ever lived here. Howard Carter's not dug the place about. It's absolutely untouched, except by a few bats and the rocks that have come down from above. So it could well be that there's a king just a few feet under me. Extraordinary, isn't it? I tell you, there are about 14 of these in this wadi. One day, I want to come back and dig them out. Can you imagine what it would be like if we found a king? Can you see us there? Have all the archaeological arc lights around the door and slowly go into the burial of a king. And then suddenly, because you're involved in an archaeological ritual, you're joining on again to the villagers because they had their rituals. Old Bootaraman, when he put the king in the coffin, he was doing it to an order, and then we'd be taken out to an order. And the two of us, if you like, or the people of today and the people of the past, which is better, be joining together over thousands of years in a single tremendous ritual.